Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. The topic of today's segment is immunoglobulins, which is generally treated as synonymous with antibodies. We're going to approach these as molecular machines. We saw in the, a previous segment that proteins don't make just catalytic enzymes. They also make molecular machines that do things we saw in the case of myosin, for example, cranking uh, um, the uh, contractile movement of uh, a muscle uh, uh, fibers uh, with respect to one another. Antibodies are another example of a very different kind of molecular machine that does some really interesting things and does them in a really interesting way. Now the whole subject of antibodies in the larger immune system is so immense that we could develop uh, devote an entire course to it. So we're obviously not going to do that and today we're going to focus mostly on antibodies as biochemical entities with just a little bit of digression into molecular biology and to um, uh, and um, cell biology as need be. Okay, so let's begin with just the basics of antibody structure. So this is a very simple cartoon version of the structure of an antibody. And there are a lot of details here that you don't need to worry about in this first image. We're going to come back and gradually fill them in over the next few minutes. And for those of you who are not already familiar with antibody structure, let me call your attention to the fact that the antigen, the thing the antibody is going to recognize, uh, symbolized here by green circles, binds to each of the tips of the Y-shaped shape structure here. So uh, native antibodies are at least bivalent, that is, they bind two copies of whatever it is they recognize. And as we'll see later, that turns out to be crucial to understanding why they're so effective at what they do. All right, so let's go all the way to the opposite extreme from this simple cartoon to a detailed structure of uh, an antibody. So the, notice the vaguely Y-shaped structure of this protein. That's what symbolized a, a moment ago. Let's uh, notice that the antibody is, uh, uh, this particular antibody, this is an IgG as it's called, a particular subform or isotype of antibodies. Uh, those details will come to it a little bit later. And notice that it consists of two copies of a light chain, two identical copies of a light chain, uh, and then two copies of the heavy chain. In this case, the two heavy chains are colored differently, one a blue and one a kind of dark yellow, so you can tell them apart. But don't be confused, those are identical as well, just as the two light chains are. So an antibody consists of four peptide chains, two copies of identical light chains, two copies of identical heavy chains. Okay. Uh, let's. Uh, what else do you notice about the uh, antibody structure here? It's just chock full of beta chain. And notice that the beta chains are organized into beta sheets, and parts of this are actually called an immunoglobulin fold because it occurs not only in antibodies but in other molecules that are evolutionary, evolutionarily related to immunoglobulins, and it's something that structure uh, st uh, investigators have learned to recognize. Let's look at some other details uh, of its structure. So notice that it has carbohydrate moieties symbolized here as space-filling models in red and green, and I'll flash the circle to call your attention to them. As we'll see later when we talk about uh, secreted proteins, membrane uh, proteins secreted across the cell membrane into the extracellular space, as antibodies most emphatically are, uh, that they have various properties, including frequently being modified by sticking carbohydrates on them post-translationally, right? The ribosome doesn't put carbohydrates there, puts only amino acids there, but carbohydrate residues are added to them. And again, in the membrane uh, segments later and in the carbohydrate segments later, we'll talk more about that. The details need not concern us too much here, but it's characteristic of an extracellular protein like an antibody that it would have, among other things, uh, carbohydrate residues attached to it. Okay. Lastly, notice this extended sort of open region that I've referred to as a hinge region. I'm f flashing the black circle on the screen so you can see it. Notice that you have at the bottom clusters of beta uh, sheet structures, and then the hinge regions, and then clusters of beta sheets up at each of the two uh, ends of the Y-shaped molecule. But in between, there's this sort of open region. This is a region that uh, 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 allows enormous flexibility of the antibody molecule. Uh, that's almost certainly relevant to its function, as we'll see later. Uh, but it, it also turns out to be really technically useful, as we'll come to in just a minute. Okay, so there's this 
version of the structure. There's the simple Y-shaped cartoon. And then here's something that's kind of in between, where there's a little bit more structural detail shown than the simple cartoon we started with, but a little less than the, the detailed structure that you saw just a moment ago. And let's use that to keep adding to our understanding of the structure of antibodies. Now we're approaching these now as sort of structural biochemists. What does the thing look like physically? And then we're going to connect this physical structure first to how it works, how it functions, and then how it comes into existence, both of which are really fascinating stories. So again, here are the light shades. So the, uh, uh, the remaining things, uh, parts not boxed in green here are the heavy chains. So let me uh, flash those boxes for you. See the light chains are diagrammed on top in this case. There are two of them. And then the two heavy chains come up to make the Y-shaped structure underneath. All right, so let's look at some of the structural features here. First, notice that these proteins have disulfide. So let me click that in and out and zero in on the screen and look there's a one pair of disulfide the one pair of disulfides the pair at the top side by side that link the light chain to the heavy chain and then notice there are two disulfides a pair of disulfides at the bottom of that uh, set of green boxes that link the two heavy chains together so in the y-shaped structure the two heavy chains are connected making the y-shaped structure stable and then the light chains are connected to that stable dimer of uh, heavy chain, each by its own disulfide bond. So we have a total of four uh, disulfide bonds. Okay, And again, as we've alluded to, a disulfide bond formation is another uh, uh, characteristic of extracellular proteins like ribonuclease that we talked about uh, earlier, for example. Uh, and so again, we're not terribly surprised to see them here in an extracellular secreted molecule like an antibody. Okay, uh, the CHO symbols here is kind of a shorthand for carbohydrate. So this is illustrating where in this version of the structure depiction you should think of the carbohydrates being added post-translationally. You see that there. See that? CHO. Okay. Now let's come back to the hinge region. So what you'll notice if you look carefully there inside the green circle is that there's both hinge region and then there's a... Uh, uh, protease called papain that's alluded to. So various proteins, papain among them, were used early in the analysis of antibodies before their structure was well understood. And it was observed that if you treated gently with this um, protease, you could break the antibody into very characteristic sub-fragments. And one of those fragments came to be called FAB, uh, and it's often just called a FAB fragment now for short. But what really it was, the, the, what FAB originally was were fragments A and B, and I'll show you where fragment C comes in a moment. But if you cleave gently with protease, and then you ran it out on a Lemley gel, a SDS gel of the sort that we've talked about earlier, you would get three fragments labeled uh, uh, by size A, B, and C. And the two largest ones, A and B, uh, are joined in this case by a disulfide, so that if you don't run a reducing gel, uh, FA and FB remain connected. That is the FAB fragment. And then let me show you where the, the uh, uh, FC fragment comes from, from proteolysis. And again, you get two copies of each of these fragments from the antibody. Let's come back and look and put the FAB fragment back on screen for a moment. It's very common these days to make analytical tools in ways that we'll talk about in later lectures by taking a, a purified antibody popul uh, um, population that we'll talk about in a few minutes how to get and cleave it with a protease and purify the FAB fragments. And then sometimes one might uh, attach a fluorescent probe to them or various other kinds of tools and send them into a complex cell biological environment to recognize their antigen. But in this case, as a FAB fragment, it's binding as a monomer. And that sometimes is quite useful technically. So you'll run into FAB fragments uh, in lots of different contexts as technical tools, as indeed antibodies themselves are uh, as well. You often don't bother to purify a FAB fragment. You purify an antibody. And then stick a probe on it. We've talked a little bit about that earlier in earlier context, sticking a, um, um, uh, connecting an enzyme, for example, uh, to an antibody uh, in the context of an ELISA assay, for example. Okay, so FAB fragments, FAB fragments, and the less commonly referred to these days, FC fragments. All right. Notice that the carboxy termini are indicated here. Do you see the COO minus carboxy termini? So let's take a moment and just understand, getting a picture of the structure again, uh, where uh, the amino and 
carboxy term and IR. So the light chains are in red here, and the heavy chains are in green, uh, bent uh, to make the Y-shaped structure. Notice that they both run N to C, that is amino terminus to carboxy terminus, uh, top to bottom. Easy little mnemonic is N sounds like antigen, so the antigen binding site at the top is where the N termini of both of these proteins are, and then they proceed downward through the Y. Uh,